And then we have uh, Dr. Mike Milligan, who's sports medicine physician there at Andrews Institute. They're going to be covering the concussion, the heat, and sudden cardiac arrest issues that are now so important in our FHSAA documents and protocol. I share with you this, that the current FHSAA protocol dealing with concussion injury and phasing students or athletes back into your program came out of the work at Andrews Institute. So they're very much aware of what this is because they were part of the development of it. But this time, Dr. Milligan, um, thanks for having us here today. Uh, I was asked uh, to come speak today to you guys and was given some topics specifically that the administrators want us to talk about. Um, and so we appreciate the invitation. Um, here today uh, on behalf of the uh, Florida High School Athletic Association and the Andrews Institute, the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, I really want to start by introducing myself because I understand sort of who's the guy in front of the room that really makes a difference in the message and so the things I'm telling you about myself aren't self-congratulatory but to let you know who I am and who this guy is in front of you. So I'm from a, I claim a little town of White, called Whiteville, North Carolina, a little town of 5,000. Um, but really I grew up between two tobacco fields about three miles outside of town and um, so that's uh, where I was born and raised, and I attended a school, a uh, little small high school there. Um, graduating class was a little less than 200. That's where I played football, um, and that was where I got to start. And uh, this guy right here, his name's Linwood Hedgepeth. He's like, yeah, he's all of you in the room here. He was uh, my first high school football coach, and he's the reason I'm standing here in front of you today. Um, he was the guy who took me under his wing as a freshman in high school, and he said, hey, here, here's the route you take if you want to get a college scholarship, play football. Here's a route you take if you want to become a physician. And he was the first person I ever looked at and he said, you can be a physician, you can be a doctor, you can do what you want to do. And I still remember that conversation sitting in this pickup truck. So everybody in this room is having an impact whether you realize it or not. And when I stand here in front of you, I understand that. So I had an opportunity to play about football at Presbyterian College. Got a good education. Um, got to play a little more. Went on medical school, <laughs> residency at East Carolina University, practiced in uh, Eastern North Carolina for a while, and then went out to Las Vegas for my additional training in sports medicine where I eventually became the uh, head team physician. And so between UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas Rebels, and Northwestern University and the Big Ten Conference in Chicago, I spent the last decade before I came down here uh, running Division I athletic programs. And in addition to that, taking care of athletes at every level besides just the Division one. So I think I've been around sports a little bit. I think I understand a little bit. And I think I have a little bit of a vantage point on the perspective of the folks in this room. And now I have the opportunity to be here at the Andrews Institute over in uh, Gulf Breeze, Pensacola, taking care of our patients there, uh, high school athletes, regular folks with regular problems, um, grandma with arthritis, so sort of see a little bit of everything. But my interest and passion is uh, sports medicine and all facets of that. And so with that introduction, um, I was asked today to talk about three topics. Uh, sudden cardiac arrest, so cardiac, cardiac issues in athletes, heat illness, heat, heat injury issues, and then that topic I can never get away from no matter where I go, concussions. Um, and so we're going to start with uh, a little bit of data. And now you'll notice that this first data here it says NCA sudden death statistics. And the reason is, is quite honestly, it's a lot harder to get hold of high school data. NCA has done a little bit better job of tracking. They haven't done a great job. They've done a little bit better job. Um, so this is a pie chart that for me as a sports doc, I see this thing all the time. And you'll notice that over 50% of that chart is accidents. It has nothing really to do with sports and the stuff we all do every day on the field, either you guys do every day on the fields and, and the courts and what have you. But obviously you have an opportunity to impact your, um, your students, your student athletes in that regard as well. In regards to the topics we're talking about today, this is why those two topics get so much attention because 17% of deaths um, are cardiac and heat. Um, a study with a little more relevance, and I realize this is football, so it doesn't apply to everybody in the room, but again, we take the data we can get a hold of. Um, 20 years of data looking at high school and college football athletes. For 20 years, across the country, 243 reported deaths over 20 years. Um, 
many of those were what we call indirect issues of illnesses, infections, um, those types of things. What direct is traumatic, right? One guy hits another guy and get an injury there. And the second, second part of the slide there, looking at college versus high school, you'll notice in virtually every category except the one in red down at the bottom there, um, things are worse off at the collegiate level than the high school level. Okay? But in one area, universities have done better, and that's uh, brain injuries. And then we look at fatalities, which is really what we're talking about and most concerned about. Again, it brings us back to our topics that we're, uh, we're talking about today. So uh, cardiac events remain the number one cause of uh, death in athletes at this level. And cardiac uh, injuries also include this condition called commotio cordis, which we'll talk about as we go through the talk. And then we have heat illness and brain injury. So those conditions, 85%. And so that's, again, why those topics are the ones that we're talking about. So sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death um, is the leading cause of uh, death in young athletes. It's predominantly males, so males more than females. Um, blacks, African Americans, for some reason, for reasons that um, may or beyond the scope of this talk, are more common than non-blacks. Uh, football and basketball. When I say basketball, it's men's and women's. Okay, so football and basketball together make up two thirds of uh, uh, deaths from sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death. Equates out to one uh, one death every three days across this country. Um, and there are your statistics for high school athletes. Um, there. So we look at it in these terms, obviously the numbers aren't enormous, but when we're talking about percentage of deaths, it's still an important player. This is a very busy slide that I took from NCAA data, again, realizing college versus high school. A couple of things I want to point out though. Again, it points out males, roughly two to three times the frequency of females. Um, the risk for a black athlete, one in 17,000 versus a non-black athlete, one in 58,000. And then we look at this in terms of sports. Basketball is our number one risk um, sport uh, for sudden cardiac arrest, males or females. Um, African Americans get at more risk. Um, and then football is down here for those wandering across the country and the like. But basketball remains our number one risk. So when we talk about sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death, there's some warning symptoms that we always got to have our ears perked up for. That picture there is a Hank Gathers for those who may remember. Some may be too young for that. Um, if, you, if you don't remember, uh, Google watch the videos of uh, his last college basketball play. Um, one of the gentlemen on the court here, I won't point him out, but I had the opportunity to be close friends with him, and he was sitting in the stands when uh, Hank uh, Gathers uh, collapsed. Um, and uh, he can talking with him about his experience uh, just reminds you of why it's, uh, why it's important. So exertional chest pain, uh, exertional syncope. So syncope is loss of consciousness, passing out, okay? So um, unexplained seizures. So lots of times folks will collapse, whether it's a cardiac event, a heat illness, a concussion. A lot of those different things will have twitching movements or what have you that can be confused for a seizure. So when you see what you think might be a seizure, be mindful it could be another condition. Um, excessive shortness of breath, disproportionate fatigue, irregular heartbeats. Hank Gathers had all, all of those um, prior to his death, and they really actually kind of knew what was going on there, and that's a conversation for another day. But uh, uh, those are warning symptoms we have to be mindful of. So as athletic trainers, as physicians, when we see athletes and we're hearing those types of symptoms, we perk our ears up and say we've got to investigate that a little farther. For you as coaches, we may or may not have all those uh, supporting uh, folks right there immediately available to you. Those are things just to be aware of. I don't expect you to read all of this on here. I don't expect you to know it or any of those things, but this here is considered the standard of care in the United States for evaluating an athlete for um, cardiac risk before participation in sports. The key piece of this is it's a, it's a defined medical history and a medical exam performed by an individual who has the right training and experience. Um, in addition to this, there's certainly instances where we'll do other testing, um, EKGs, echocardiograms, those things. But the standard of care is this 14-point exam right here, which consists of questions and a physical. So when you, when you see an athlete and you uh, recognize that they may be having a, a cardiac event, that they've collapsed, they're unresponsive, um, maybe they're having those seizure movements that we mentioned earlier, um, 
first thing you got to think when that athlete goes down is this a cardiac event till proven otherwise. Okay. So when I uh, when I see that, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And then when I see when I go out on the field, the first thing I look for is that defibrillator. Okay. So I'm covering an event. I'm, I'm covering baseball game this weekend. First thing I do when I show up after I shake the athletic trainer's hand is I say, "Where's that defibrillator at?" Um, I'm standing on the Division One sidelines. My athletic trainers are out there. I walk out there and say, "Where was it?" Um, and they knew they better be able to point it out to me real quick. Um, so I strongly recommend for you to you know where yours are. Um, CPR, I presume most folks in the room are trained in that. If you're not, I strongly suggest you get trained. Um, that's the, the number one thing you can do to save your athlete. And put that AED on once you get it. Uh, the great thing about AED is you slap those patches on and it's going to record that heart rhythm and it's going to give you a verbal um, um, right there on the spot of if there's an abnormal rhythm, a lack of rhythm, those types of things. So combining CPR with your application of AED, you can do a lot quickly for your athlete. <coughs> Why is being prepared and knowing where your AED is at, having CPR training important? The statistics are right there in front of you. Um, survival after class from a cardiac event is uh, declined by 7 to 10% per minute. So within 10 to 15 minutes, your chances of saving that athlete are, are basically gone. Okay? So the person standing there at the time is the person who has the best shot. If you apply CPR, survival improves. So you don't have an AED, start giving chest compressions, start giving breaths. You can, you can extend the, the opportunity to save that athlete. So having an emergency action plan is something that everyone should have, obviously at all their venues, whether it's where you lift weights, where you practice, where you play at. Um, having CPR trained individuals there and having a defibrillator, those are the things most important, saving your athletes with cardiac event. American Heart Association clearly defines some recommendations there on what you should do to be prepared. Number one is uh, have a plan in place to call when there's an emergency, so whether it's calling 911, whether it's activating your campus um, system, depending on where you are, getting your bystanders involved. So for those of you coaching, we have a coaching staff. Your, your group of coaches, you gotta have a plan. Everybody's got a role there if an athlete goes down. Applying defibrillation early with an AED and applying CPR quickly are obviously very important. And then getting your, your experts, your EMS crews and whatnot involved to uh, assist and uh, care of that athlete. Another condition I mentioned earlier, um, we saw on that slide at the very beginning there, 2.9% of deaths in football have been related to this condition called commotion cortis. Um, another name for it is a cardiac concussion. Um, most, opportunity, most injuries from, uh, from this condition are actually a, a ball, a baseball, a softball, a hockey puck, what have you, hitting um, an athlete in the chest. This is a very real condition. Um, I have uh, had colleagues who have dealt with this. Um, it's typically a, a younger athlete. It's most commonly a male. It's usually an athlete under the age of about 14 or 15. Takes a hit to the chest. Um, the classic example is much like this picture here. The athlete gets hit in the chest there. They'll often <coughs> take the hit, rebound back a little bit, take a few steps around the mound. They'll look like they're shaking it off, and then they collapse. When that happens, AED, then out of the field, not the other way around. If you see that hit in the chest and they go down, grab that AED on the way out there. Your window is very, very short for saving that athlete. Survival rates, 16%. Add an AED, 46%. Grab the AED, then go out there. That's why it's important. You gotta be prepared, you gotta think about it before it ever happens because you get one chance. Your career, you may, if you see one, you'll probably only see one. And you've got, you're the person that's gonna have that chance to save that athlete's life. Changing gears, he knows. So we talk about heat illness, we're really talking about two conditions today, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Heat exhaustion, one we're all familiar with, we've all probably experienced at least once or twice living down here or in the south anywhere that many of us live. Um, this is less severe illness, right? You get hot, you don't feel good, you can't keep exercising as hard as you were. Um, it occurs when you're, uh, you know, you're working at a hard, hard level, which usually happens in hot conditions. Uh, the South obviously is notorious because we've got heat and humidity. Um, 
And, you know, those athletes tend to recover well. They take a little break. They get a little cold dumped on top of their head. They get a little water break, those kind of things. And hopefully usually rebound. In some cases, it can be a bit more debilitating, and it's hard for them to recover for the rest of practice. <coughs> then there's this other condition called heat stroke. Why is that important? Well, it's a medical emergency. So in medicine, we talk about medical emergencies. There's a pretty short list of those, and this is one of them. What happens? First, two things happen. We have brain dysfunction, so CNS dysfunction, central nervous system dysfunction, or brain dysfunction, and we have organ failure. Those things kill. Those key things cause permanent, um, permanent harm. The delay in treatment leads to death. So when you recognize it, when you think about it, you gotta act on it. And what's the treatment? It's immediate cooling, okay? So you gotta get the athlete cooled off. Cool the patient first, transport them second. You'll hear, hear that again because that's important. So heat exhaustion. So heat exhaustion, kind of the difference between that heat struggle and the key, key differences is body temperature. So core body temperature. Most of you aren't gonna have the ability to measure core body temperature where you're at because that requires, in most cases, a rectal thermometer um, or some other type of internal thermometer. So you're not gonna have that. I hear some laughs, it's funny, but I'll tell you to stand on Division One sideline in August for football, we've got it sitting there. We've got a plan in place to do it, and we've done it, and we save lives. And I've seen, I've also seen athletes who uh, are no longer uh, academically successful as they were, and are no longer playing sports, who are highly successful Division One athletes. So it seems funny. Um, we get some laughs about it, but uh, it's important. Now, heat exhaustion, this athlete's gonna typically recover. You know, this guy here is probably a pretty good example of that. These athletes are going to feel dizzy. They're going to feel lightheaded. They don't want to continue going. They may have headaches, nausea. Um, they may have clammy skin. You know, it's hot. They're sweating when they got that cool, clammy skin that you see. Um, so that's heat exhaustion. It comes in severities and degrees, and some of those will recover and come back to practice the same day. Some of them are going to take a few days before they feel better. And then we have heat stroke. One of the big differentiating factors is core body temperatures we already talked about. It's got to be over 104 usually. Can you have a temperature of 104 core temperature and not have heat stroke? You can. So it's not just the temperature. It's also the other pieces. So CNS, that central nervous system piece I mentioned earlier. So what are you going to see? Some of the same symptoms you saw before, so it's hard to differentiate, right? They're, they're dizzy, they don't feel right, they act a little off. When do you start noticing? Well, when they start really acting funny, they start becoming very emotionally labile, as we call it. So their, their mood is very different. Um, they're asking questions that just don't make sense. Um, they just don't look right. They're staggering. In, in bad cases, they lose consciousness or they do have seizures. Other things you might see, they may be weak. We've, we've been taught in the past, when I was growing up, you couldn't have heat stroke if you are still sweating. Well, that's not true, okay? You can still be sweating, you can still be trying to cool yourself and actually be having heat stroke. So wait until you see an athlete who has dry skin to decide to have heat stroke is a, is a fallacy. Uh, the blood pressure may be low, they may be hyperventilating, they may have uh, vomiting or diarrhea. So it's really hard to differentiate these, but you gotta just keep an eye on these athletes, monitor them, you know, um, when you're in those situations, you gotta be prepared. Uh, prevention is the number one thing you can do. It starts with your sports physical. Um, by the history you take, athletes who've had previous heat illness or heat stroke um, are much more prone to future heat illness or heat stroke. Um, medications and supplements are a big issue. There are some medications that athletes will be on that in and of themselves will predispose to heat illness. Supplements are a huge issue, okay? Um, in this room, many of you have athletes who are using supplements. Some of you may talk to your athletes about supplements. You just got to be aware that some of those can cause issues. And you can't look at the label and know which ones they are. So if you're having an athlete who's struggling and they haven't before, one of the first things I ask them is, are, are you taking anything? You know, you're not gonna get in trouble for taking it, tell me what it is so we can figure out that's a contributor. Um, the acclimatization period that we all have, especially for football, but we have in all of our sports, is very important. Be cautious with athletes you have coming in who've been sick, okay? Especially during times of year, like uh, the, the, the summer and the early fall when we're out there practicing. 
uh, an athlete has been sick or ill, cough, cold, bronchitis, whatever it is, those athletes are much more prone to heat illness, heat stroke. They're not going to tolerate the heat as well. Um, their, their internal body thermometer is off because of that illness. Um, see many athletes collapse over time with heat illness from uh, who have never had problems before because they were recently ill. And then educating your athletes. You know, you see the picture here on the right. They've got the fans. They've got ice. They're dumping water on their heads. They're cooling themselves off. Got to prevent it, right? And then, what is heat, heat illness and heat stroke? At the end of the day, it's a problem getting rid of that heat. So, because we live in the south and it's hot and humid, you, you sweat sweat a lot. It's not evaporating. It's not cooling you off. If you've ever lived in the southwest in the desert, you, you know what that's like. You go out there and. You come home from a run in the middle of the summer and your shirt's completely dry because that sweat evaporates right away and it's pulling you off. We don't have that ability here. So how do we take care of these athletes? Well, we got to have an emergency action plan. If you have the ability, you have a plan for core body temperature measurement. If you don't, you at least have one of these things over here on the right-hand side, a big bucket of ice water or cold water or whatever you can get. And those are most important pieces. Now, after you have someone who's had heat illness, it's going to be a slow return to play usually. Um, they're just not going to tolerate practice as well. They're not going to have their legs under them. They're going to be sort of kind of have jelly legs, all those kind of things. If they end up in a hospital with heat stroke, it's probably going to be quite a while. Depends on what type of organ issues they have. And then again, if you, ever, if you see this issue, you think, of, think it could be healed to heat illness, cool first, transport second. Um, I can tell you some um, some universities now are actually uh, preemptively cooling guys. I know one one university that in uh, August, September, October, some of those games when it's still hot, and humid out, they'll bring them in at halftime in the football team and they'll put them in these. So the coaches come, to the athletes, they put them in there. They're actually showing increases in performance and the second half of games because they're getting these guys cooled off uh, back to a, a normal body temperature. So it's an interesting thing to think about. Just this is a slide we use with our physicians talking about the differences in cooling. There used to be this myth out there that if you took a hot athlete and you put them in a bucket of ice water and make them hotter and make their heat stroke worse. Well, that just doesn't make sense if you ever jumped in a cold bucket of water. But uh, uh, they had to do the studies to prove that because uh, folks thought otherwise. Um, the NATA uh, put together uh, a piece uh, several years ago now that you can have in your um, your manuals and whatnot have your student athletes sign talking about um, authorization for measuring core body temperature. So for places that want to look at this or have had issues, you actually have a way to, um, this already been vetted out to uh, establish a protocol there. And then the final topic we've got to talk about today is concussions. And I say that for last for two reasons. One, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I get asked about this all the time and I think it's an important topic, but I don't think it's the most important. Why don't I think it's the most important? Because it's nowhere on that pie chart we talked about earlier. Okay? Um, but concussions obviously are important. It's something we're all facing and we're having to deal with. Um, as Coach mentioned earlier in his talk, you know, back when I played football, I, I don't remember anyone ever being held out with a concussion. Of course, I probably don't remember much in my high school career and my college career at that, too. But um, it all worked out okay. So. Uh, I saw this uh, slide here. I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but sometimes I feel like that's where we're going with this topic. Uh, it says two players collide, airbags inflate, and another soccer tragedy is averted. Um, but uh, obviously, with all the, the joking, the laughing, um, sort of those kind of things, trying to minimize it, you know, concussions are a real problem. Okay, they're impacting our sports at every level. It's not going away. The NFL wrote it, right, is writing a check for a billion dollars. NCA is writing a check for I think it's like three quarters of a billion or something like that. Um, you don't write those checks if there's not a real issue we've got to deal with. So we want to make sure we talk about it and uh, try to cover some of the basics for it. So what is a concussion? There's about 45 different uh, medical organizations out there that have their own definitions of a concussion, their own um, sort of uh, position statements as we call them. Simplifying it down, concussion is a brain injury. We don't fully understand that yet. Okay, tell me what happens in your body that does not is not impacted by brain function, and I'll tell you what concussion can't be. Okay, 
So concussion very simply is a brain injury. It disrupts any function of your brain. So any area of your body, any area of your life that is impacted by your brain can be impacted by a concussion. Why are the symptoms? Well, it's really changed a lot over the last decade or so how we think about depression. We now think about it in terms of various domains. There's a physical domain, so there's some of the symptoms we can have. It's a short list. Common ones that you're going to see, you have seen, if you think about things like having a headache, having dizziness, being nauseous, um, feeling uh, unsteady on your feet, lights and sounds bothering you, okay? What we call photo and phonosensitivity. So those are some common symptoms. Cognitive impairment, so our ability to think and concentrate can be impaired. So some common symptoms that athletes will report, and they won't often say it until you ask them specifically. But you say, do you feel foggy? And they go, yeah, it just doesn't feel right. You know, they'll kind of reach out. Do they feel slowed down in the classroom or looking at plays, you know, if you're diagramming a play on the board or explaining something, um, they can't concentrate on as well. Forgetfulness, um, confusion, slowness of response. So you're interacting with this athlete on the sideline or in practice and you know your athletes probably better than anybody and they're just not responding and interacting with you in that normal way. Are there things to be aware of? Then there's the emotional uh, presentation of concussions. So irritability, sadness, um, nervousness. Now obviously these aren't very specific. A lot of different things can cause this. And if you're if you're taking care of middle school and high school athletes or even college athletes, professional athletes, most of them are irritable, moody, and hard to get along with anyway. So um, you kind of got to take all that with a grain of salt, right? There are things to be aware of. And you know that difference, right? You know these athletes, and more times than not, you can say, you know, yeah, he's a challenge, but this is a little different. And sleep impairment, one that's often not recognized, but a lot of these athletes will have issues with sleep. They'll have problems with insomnia, frequently waking up at night, um, or being excessively sleepy. You know, for a 16-year-old, excessively sleepy, he's got to be probably more than 15 hour a day, I guess, but um, you know, it happens. So we look at uh, concussion in terms of various um, categories there. All right, so got this next slide, hoping that'll wake up a few people in the room, but there's a point there. Um, why, why does he have a mouse on the, on the screen? And that's because a lot of the data we have, a lot of the studies that have been done that have got us to where we are in 2016 have to do with these little varmints. And uh, so I didn't put the uh, pictures of uh, the actual research studies because uh, kind of, you know, kind of gruesome. But mice have been really an integral part of our research on concussions. And this slide in particular that came from study of uh, the brains of mice um, and, and what happens to the chemicals within the brain after a head injury has really uh, served as the basis for a lot of what we have now. So this slide here um, shows various chemicals, calcium, sugar, glucose, lactic acid, potassium, and how those change after a head injury, okay? And what's the key point here? If you look at the bottom here and look at it in terms of days, typically around seven to 10 days is when everything resolves back to normal. So when everybody wonders where the, where the Florida High School Association come up with this seven, six, seven day return to play, protocol, where'd that come from? And this is the key basic, the basis of it, okay? There's some other more gruesome studies done in dogs that I won't talk about, but they also showed the same thing, okay? These are older studies. There was a study that just came out a few weeks ago where they did it all again because folks are questioning, you know, there's folks out there who want to say, hey, we should be able to get these guys back two or three days, not a week. Well, they just did some new studies, reproving that the brain hasn't changed any over the last 15 years. It still takes a little bit of time for all those chemicals to um, re, re uh, equilibrate after injury. They're doing scans now, looking at this. This is a, a, a PET MRI scan where they're looking at this and showing some um, issues with how glucose and other chemicals are taken up in the brain after injury. Um, this isn't a specific case, just an example of what's being done out there some places to try to research this. Um, so we get the things that uh, you guys kind of care about and matter day to day. Uh, what do you do immediately after injury? So if you have an athlete that's injured, I think everybody knows they need to come out, right? Whether it's practice or competition, they're done for the day. That standard was set uh, 10 years ago now and um, remains the standard pretty much at every level of uh, 
athletic participation, at least in the U.S. Um, if you have an athletic trainer on the sideline, that's your first resource. Get that person involved. That's what they're there for, have an assessment. If you don't have that, then um, give them to a medical provider who's got experience taking care of concussions. Um, red flag signs and symptoms. So what are red flags uh, of uh, a, a worse head injury that we got to be aware about? So they lose consciousness and they don't quickly regain that consciousness. They're awake. They're walking around. They seem to be normal and then they collapse. Okay? I know at least four athletes in communities where I've lived have collapsed and died from head injuries. Okay? Um, I, know, I know multiple physicians who are close friends of mine who have stood and watched an athlete die on the sideline that they were trying to take care of from a head injury. So it happens and it's real. So those are sort of some of the big symptoms to be aware of. Um, remember, and this is a part that challenges folks and they have a hard time accepting this, concussion symptoms do not always present immediately after the injury. It can be the next day, it can be two days later. Um, it's uh, living the last 10 years living in college athletics, you know, I had 500 athletes that I knew really well and 120 football players I knew very, very well. And we'd see every one of those guys after a game and we'd look at them and it was more than one time I saw a guy after a game and he looked stone cold normal, looked fine. He came in the next day, he's glassy eyed, he's just not right. Okay? They do not always present acutely right there on the spot and that's hard to accept for folks but it's, it's reality. Okay? One university did a study where they looked at all their uh, concussed football players. Um, they didn't publish this, but they did a study where they looked at all the concussed football players and in about 20% of cases they could not identify the hit. These were practice injuries. They could not identify the hit in practice where the injury occurred. So what's the point of that? Many of the hits that cause concussion injuries are innocuous. They're, they, they, don't kind of, they don't come up on our radar of attention. So we have to just be mindful of what the athletes are reporting and what they're describing to us um, in those situations. You probably have seen this, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but it's called the SCAT 3 form. It's a sideline assessment tool. It's been around in various versions for a decade or so now. It's about a four page document. This is just the first page of it. Um, but it's a tool you can use on the sideline, evaluate an athlete. It's particularly helpful if you have baseline data already um, on file on the athlete so you can compare pre and post injury. So it's a nice tool for just doing an, an initial assessment there when you're suspicious. So what happens uh, when an athlete ends up in, uh, in, in my office or another uh, healthcare provider's office and uh, we suspect they have a concussion possible? First thing I want to do is understand the, the mechanism of injury, how they, get, how they get injured. So I ask the athlete how it happened, I ask mom or dad who's in the, who was in the stands how it happened, if we can get a report from a coach or another athlete, that's very helpful. Um, you want to look at their symptoms after that injury, okay? Um, and often your athlete's not aware of how they're different. So mom and dad's perception, coach's perception. Many times these days it's a teammate who's noticed the, the issue and, 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 and got someone involved to help out with that athlete's care. Um, physical exam is an important part of what we do. Um, we're looking a lot these days for issues with balance, issues with visual function, issues with how the eyes move, um, and we're also looking at problems with the neck because we know that all those conditions can be treated and all those conditions, if treated, can help us get these athletes feeling better quicker. And then neurocognitive testing. Um, I wasn't here earlier in the morning, but I understand you guys talked some about baseline testing possibly here in athletes, and so the baseline testing is something we do to look at neurocognitive function, so brain function, ability to think and concentrate. That's a valuable tool when we're deciding if the athlete is ready to go back to participation. So have they fully recovered? Are they back to their baseline level of brain function? So another fact to be aware of, especially as a coach, when you've got athletes and you're wondering why is this athlete still out, you can go ahead and sort of prepare yourself by knowing in advance what are some modifying factors, what are some things that we know tend to foretell that an athlete's going to take longer to recover. Female athletes in general recover slower than male athletes. If athletes who have a prior history of concussion, particularly in the last six to 12 months, tend to recover more slowly, have symptoms for longer. Athletes who have depression, anxiety, other mental health 
um, conditions tend to heal and recover slower. <coughs> athletes with a history of migraine or significant headache issues, and then athletes with learning disorders, particularly ADD and ADHD, all those athletes on average recover more slowly than their peers who do not have those associated conditions. And then how do we take care of these athletes? Well, we all know that like your athletes are told they can't come, they can't practice, they can't work out, they gotta rest. You know, this is really changing over the last five or six years. Um, years ago, it was put them in a dark room, turn off the lights, turn off the TV. Well, that's gone now. Uh, one coach out there in Texas who put somebody in the shed, I think kind of really brought that to light, for those who remember that. Um, and uh, so fortunately, we're not doing that too much anymore. Um, but these days we talk about activity modification. So this is challenging um, because this requires a lot of communication back and forth with your athlete. But we talk about activity modification. So what do we tell the athlete? You can do things that don't bother you and don't exacerbate your symptoms. Now does that mean that day two after injury we're going to put them back out on the football field? No. But we might let them get on the bike or we might let them jog some or get on their um, video games or text message or whatever. So things that don't exacerbate their symptoms. Now, that's important for a couple reasons. One, we're stimulating brain function in good ways. Probably most importantly, we're keeping them happy because as soon as you start taking away everything from an athlete, or any of us for that matter, we start getting down, we start getting depressed, that starts impacting our ability to feel better, recover. We start feeling disconnected from our teammates and the sport that we love or whatnot as an athlete, right? So modifying activities instead of just saying all activities are off limits. Academic modification. I can tell you, coming to, coming to this level where I'm seeing a lot of high school athletes, this part's, this part's challenging for me as a physician. When I was in a collegiate setting, I had all these advisors and other folks, uh, disabilities office and all kinds of folks who would sort of take this and run with it. And, I just sort of say make sure that the class is going okay, let me know if you have any issues. The high school level is really challenging, really, it really requires uh, coaches, administrators, teachers, athletic trainers, medical providers really collaborating together to kind of formulate plans around academic modifications because it's a real problem if you don't give these kids the time to sort of recover, they're going to be many times challenged in class. All of you have those athletes who are type A on the field and in the classroom. And those kids struggle when they're told, hey, you're going to get behind in school because you need to take a little time off. Um, all of you have at least one teacher in your school who's a challenging who says, no, I'm not going to give you time off or a break from taking this test, right? And I know it happens because I see athletes every single week who say they've been in back and mom and the kid have talked to the teacher and they say, no, you got to do it now. It takes collaborating, it takes pulling together and recognizing this is, a, this is an effort to get this athlete better. Some of you, most of you are probably familiar, but if you're not, physical therapy has become a much more utilized tool in the care of concussed athletes. Many athletes, as I mentioned earlier, have problems with, um, with balance, problems with vision, and we can now assess that in the uh, physician exam room, and then we can get that treated working with our physical therapists. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, neck injuries, neck spasms, sore neck, those types of things are also now very much recognized as a contributing factor to concussion symptoms. And if we don't get that better, the concussion symptoms don't get better. So we're using physical therapy a lot more in the care of concussed uh, athletes. I put medication down here with question marks. There are instances where you'll have athletes who are put on medications. And there's one thing that those 40 some physician statements agree on that I mentioned earlier. That athlete needs to be off all those medicines and feeling well before they go back to sports. The other piece you have to be mindful of is for most of you, you're taking care of uh, athletes who are um, teenagers or, um, or, or younger. And many of the medications we talk about using have risk that you've got to be very cognizant of in this population. Um, and so you've got to be very judicious in considering medication treatment for athletes with concussion. So, Talk about management of concussion. Got two categories really for our athletes. We got return to learn and return to play. What I tell athletes is if you can't handle it in the classroom because of your concussion, then you can't be on the field or on the court. Okay? Um, 
kind of accepted standards that many abide by is when you can sit in class or you can sit and read um, or what have you for 30 minutes consecutively without causing concussion symptoms, then you can return to the classroom. And then you need to be able to take a 15 minute break every 30 to 45 minutes. Um, those are considered standards of care. As I mentioned earlier, a collaborating team of professionals on the, the, the school side as well as the uh, medical side is really critical to this. Return to play. You gotta be symptom free at rest. You gotta be symptom free in the classroom. You gotta be symptom free with activity. Um, you gotta be off of medications that were utilized to help you feel better. You gotta be off of those. You know, standing medications you take routinely, that's fine. But anything you're using for pain, headaches, mood, those kind of things, you need to be off of those. Um, that progression that you're all familiar with, that six day progression um, that we have, you gotta be asymptomatic through all those stages. And then we return to play progression modifications. So you guys saw the slide earlier. We talked about why we have that six day return to play. That six day return to play is the bare minimum. Um, the, the standards and the recommendations out there by all those organizations I mentioned earlier is that you modify that plan based on the, the circumstances of your athlete. So the athlete who's had multiple concussions needs to have a longer return to play plan. The athlete who's had symptoms for four weeks, well, they're suddenly well on Monday, they're not going to be ready to go on Saturday, okay, or Friday or what have you. Um, you have to modify those based on that, and that's considered standard quality practice for concussion care. Um, this forum we've mentioned, you guys are very familiar with it. And then there's my references. Uh, thanks for your time. Any questions, we're happy to take those. Couple of things. First of all, academic accommodations after concussion. Absolutely, we're going to do that. So I will be coordinating with uh, with our curriculum department. That's important. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure I contact Mr. Chambers, and we'll we'll make sure we can do that. Um, the AEDs. Coordinate with your trainers, and by all means, you can take that from the field house, bring it onto the field. We just have to make sure it gets back into the case so that it can recharge. So, you know, last thing you want is an AED that's not charged. So we got to make sure that someone has accountability to take it to the field or the court and get it back. I think that's important um, because the time, like, you know, the slides that we saw, minutes lost is, is not something we want to do. So coordinate that at each of your schools. Um, I think every every cross country and football program should have a kiddie pool ready to immerse those kids at practice somewhere in the shade. I mean, those things should be there just in case. You can't get the kid back if we lose one. You can't get it back. And then the last thing is, um, in talking with representatives from Andrews, the uh, they were saying that proper helmet fit was the, was a great uh, way to reduce concussions and reduce injuries. So football coaches, your your helmet reps can come out and train whoever's, you know, wiggle the face back, oh you're good. You know, whoever's doing that and fitting them, the helmet reps can uh, can help you out with training. So uh, that that's it. Y'all have a great day.